We're, We're Batman, Batman at 89. Hello, and welcome back to Bat Minute 89, the podcast where we analyze Tim Burton's 1989 Batman film, One Minute at a Time. Uh, you've come here for bat analysis, princely chatter, and hair color so natural, only your undertaker knows for sure. <laughs> I am your, I am one of your hosts, uh, Niall McGowan. And I am the other one, John Parker. Uh, no relation to, or Ed, is, is there any relation to Ray Parker Jr.? Uh, or is yeah. it because he's, is it because he's Parker Jr. that's different from Parker? Oh, no, very, very close relative. Uh, we see each other all the time, Christmas, you know, even Easter. Yeah. Oh, is he still, uh, has he, has he got any other theme tunes in the works? Or? No. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's, he's done his one. He's, he's earned his rest. <laughs> that sounds enough. like he's dead. I'm apo- I apologize. Well, you know, if anyone could come back from the dead oh. for a hit single, could be Ray Parker Jr. Maybe that that will be the gimmick. It's like he's literally a ghost this time. Oh, that 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 needs to be in a sequel if they do go ahead with one. Get get him in as a ghost. <laughs> Boom, done. Although uh speaking weirdly tying into to this to this film, uh I think it was a Batman Opened a week after Ghostbusters 2. Yes, just one week. So Yeah, so uh, some stiff... Well, I say, like, stiff competition. This film completely trashed that because <laughs> it was... This was a mega hit, but, like... Uh, it's a very but different, are, different type of movie as well. It was going for a different... Yeah. Not necessarily a different audience because we love both of them, but, you know, it's... it's... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are both, we should say, uh, because we know it's a point of contention on the internet, that uh, we are both staunch defenders of Ghostbusters yes, too. So, so I would say shout out Ghostbusters Minute, but they don't really like the second one. <laughs> but still, well, shout well, out anyway, you know. Just shout them out for the first yeah. one. Just, being, just, just to be nice. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we are now entering into Minute 2 of uh, 1989's Batman. And hello, what have we here? <laughs> we have that was a sensual. Distinctly- <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was going for. This is me, uh, John. I'm gonna have to be honest with you. This whole podcast is just—it's just been me trying to come on to you the whole oh. time, and I've been—I've been sending signals left, right, and center. Well, but... shouldn't we? We should have dragged the romance out over the show, uh, a la Friends or something. But uh... oh, I mean, like uh, Cheers. Oh, cheers, yes. <laughs> you could be, uh, you could be Sam. I'll be Diane. Oh, I want to be Diane. All right, you can be yes. Diane. No one wants to be Diane. Are you crazy? <laughs> but but uh, anyway, now that we've uh, went on a random tangent for... Yes, uh, Batman. <laughs> Batman. This is Batman yeah. show. And uh, getting back to what uh, I was alluding to with my smooth, uh, sensuous impersonation, mm-hmm. we uh, have uh, the latest credits to pop up is one for Billy D. Williams. Oh, the master. William... Yeah. Yeah, William December Williams. Uh, people will remember uh, remember him from uh, such uh, hit films as uh, Moving Target with uh, with Michael Dudikoff and uh, Mask of Death with uh, Lorenzo Lamas. So, How could uh, we forget? And then he, and I think he did those. Uh, we didn't get them in uh, you know in Ireland in the UK. Uh, the Colt Forty Five commercials. But uh, beyond that, I don't think he did anything no, else. No, nothing, so. nothing of note at all. Um, mostly those adverts, those commercials he's known for. I think in the in the US. Yeah, so I think that's that's the legacy of Billy <laughs> D. And uh, we'll 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 get talking about him when we get into. Oh the wait, film. he did I some think. other thing, didn't he? Um, uh, he did. Uh, oh, the Empire Wasn't Strikes on, Back. Like... That was it. That. that... I don't know if you've heard of them. Was that one of those Battlestar Galactica movies? Yeah, yeah. I think it's the the second one, something like that. Oh, I don't watch those. <laughs> so I wouldn't know. Sorry. Yet again, I can't keep up the pretense. <laughs> Billy D, my hero, my knight. We uh we do love Billy D around here. We love Orlando. Um yeah. but also uh I mean Burton wanted him to be uh coming back as this character in the sequels, didn't he? As Two Face. Um Yeah, he was uh obviously contracted in to but do actually, so. Uh, one other Moving thing, on. actually, Burton though. 
Um, he wanted him back for the sequels. This is a weird thing, specifically because he liked the concept of um, black and white. So he wanted an African American to play the part, and I assume that the the two face sort of the other side of his face was going to be sort of burnt to the skull or something, which is quite <laughs> grotesque, but uh, quite quite Tim yeah, Burton. Yeah, I mean, it would have been interesting to see. I th- that reminds me of, like, Two-Face in that uh, like that episode of Star Trek where, like, the, the, the dueling races... <laughs> or, or, like, they had, like, one one half of their face... One half of their whole bodies was literally painted black and the other half was painted white. Great episode. Like, really yeah. uh, hitting it home with the, with the message. And shout out Star Trek Minute. Oh, yeah. And, of course, uh, as we are lewd to do, apparently... Uh, tying everything back into batman that episode uh is frank gorshin isn't it he's one of the aliens oh, yeah yeah good point frank frank gorshin played the riddler in the adam west batman tv show oh my god it's all everything gone. connected it's like a, oh, everything's falling into place now <laughs> uh but uh yeah so uh billy d we'll be talking about billy d williams in de- in great oh, depth yeah i'm sure as the film goes on uh, our next uh, credit to pop up uh, is uh, Michael Go, uh, great great actor uh, who plays uh, Alfred in this film, and uh, along with Pat Hingle, is uh, one of the the two the only two actors to appear in the first four yes. of the Batman films. But so. he deserved to. Well, yeah, his, his Alfred yeah. is. Thing is, yeah, his Alfred's very good. But he is like he is seventy one at the time, so there is a kind of like, Bruce, dude, just let's let him retire. <laughs> like what? Yeah, the, the poor why guy you're working like, him to death. There's a bit like later on where like he's closing the the door to like the bats where all the bat suits are, and there's this giant iron door, <laughs> and it's a feeble old man. It's like Bruce, what are you so doing? He's closing the door there and closing the door on his life. Yeah, <laughs> and it is one of those things. Like at least in uh, like the recent Batman versus Superman, like Jeremy Irons is actually great as Alfred as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. But but he looks like oh this Alfred, at least he's out and about. He looks like he can <laughs> he'll be around for a couple of years. Well, though, but, uh, uh, Michael Go though in real life he he did live to be ninety four. He died in uh, twenty eleven. So that's not bad. That's a uh, good going. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, fair enough. Although I do remember him. Uh, because he features in uh, a few Tim Burton films, he's actually you can see um, you can see throughout this film that there's a real influence of uh, like Hammer horror oh, yeah. on Tim Burton. Like that's one of his kind of go-to things. And of course, Michael Go is a Hammer horror actor. Like he appeared in uh, the first Christopher Lee Dracula. Film. Yes, yes, I was going to bring like that one the, up. That's uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, and. Uh, then uh, beyond that, like he, um, so he appears in like a uh, Tim Burton because he's one of the voices in Corpse Bride, and I remember he's a really desiccated skeleton character. And at that point, because like I knew him growing up, I was like, oh, that's Alfred. He's really old. Didn't see him for years, and then seen this like desiccated skeleton, <laughs> and I was like, is this like a picture of what Michael Go looks like now? Because <laughs> he must be like so old. That was just footage of it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he's been in a couple of good things of note. Uh, Serpent in the Rainbow, the Wes Craven uh, voodoo thing, it's pretty. It's kind of a mixed bag, but it's got its it's got its highlights, oh, yeah. and he's very good in it. And uh, yeah, Top Secret. As yeah, well. working with Val Kilmer, uh, which he late, later oh, yeah. does in in one of the Batman movies, obviously, which we will eventually get all to. All connected, John. <laughs> They're all connected. All of it, everything. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, he was in uh, two Alice in Wonderlands. Like his last role was in Tim Burton's eh, version of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, yeah. But he was also in uh, the like 1960s BBC production where he played the March Hare, which I did watch. I remember actually having to watch it for a, a uni, a university assignment. Just say uni, that Americans would get with uni. <laughs> ah, they can That's figure it out. They can look it up. <laughs> It was college. I had to watch him for college. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And uh, so, you know, it's a kind of a through line there, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, Alice in Wonderland, the Tim Burton version, was his last part. So. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's not as if he didn't get a good <laughs> innings. I mean, but then up next, it's like it's so tragic. He's 150 years old, but he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, still, it is a shame. It is a shame. Uh, but the the next credit is uh, none other than Jack Palance, a very uh, famous actor. Oh yes, uh, Jack Palance is in loads of things. Not as many things actually as I thought he was. I always get him mixed up with. Um, they call him uh, the guy who played Andrew Packard in Twin Peaks. Oh, yeah. Da- What's his name? Dan O'Hurley. Yes, yes. Who is in, like, is in, is in Halloween 3 and uh, Robocop 2. I mean, he's in, he's in Robocop and he's in Robocop Why did two, you mention so. 2 first? Most people wouldn't go that way around. I meant Robocop T-O-O oh, <laughs> the first time okay. But uh, I used to always think that it was, like, the same guy when I was growing up. Because I saw Twin Peaks when it was repeated in uh, Ireland in like the late nineties when I was so I was quite young when I was watching yeah. it, and uh, it's a new Batman, and I had this kind of weird like, oh, that's the same guy, yeah. but like now I look at it, and it's like that. Was, I guess I was just being like ageist because like no, it's just two <laughs> old men who look nothing alike. <laughs> to children, all old people just look the same. They're just a homogenous glob. <laughs> but uh, but. Uh, you know, and then the uh, Jack Palance though actually did have a very, a genuinely very good, uh, long career. So oh, very long, uh, he's in everything. It, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, most notably, like, one of his big roles, I suppose, is uh, Shane. He's the uh, was like the the main antagonist in that. Uh, and then of course he won his uh, Oscar for City Slickers of all things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not. Uh... Not the type of uh, movie you expect to win an Oscar. <laughs> no, but I mean, he's good in it. But uh, I have a friend who would argue that uh, City Slickers 2, The Legend of Curly's Gold, is a, is a, you know, a better film and a better performance from Jack Your Palance. friend is wrong. <laughs> well, like, actually, I should say, uh, shout out to uh, City Slickers 2, The Legend of Curly Gold, Minute. Surely uh, it's so- getting made. <laughs> it's, they're a completely, completely different group from uh, the City Slickers Minute. <laughs> they're at war. Oh yeah, they don't they don't even want to share notes. Well, their their Jack Balance facts completely differ from all <laughs> other people's Jack Balance facts. But uh, and I should say too, um, in like looking into Jack and looking at the, I actually watched his Oscar acceptance speech, which is something oh, to God, see. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's, it's because uh, he like he he gets up on stage and and that year you know obviously Billy Crystal's Billy Crystal is hosting the Oscars and uh, you know he he's co-starred with Jack Palance in City Slickers and Palance is, uh, gets up on stage and like this is like we should put this on the Facebook page for, uh, for you know, when this episode oh, yeah, airs, remind me but, to do uh, that I will forget so <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah Jack Palance gets up to the mic and he's just like Billy Crystal. I crap bigger than him, and then he starts going on this uh, this little kind of mini tirade about like ageism in Hollywood, <laughs> and uh, he's going like, "Oh, they think you know you're a liability and you can't you can't work hard and all this kind of stuff," and then he's, he he starts goes he goes over and starts doing push ups at the side of the stage. <laughs> it's crazy, and it's just like this isn't. Yeah, like, like this is amazing. <laughs> as soon as you told me about that, I had to go and watch it about two minutes later, and I was just in stitches. I was just laughing so much. <laughs> I had to watch it twice. And again, uh, in our everything is connected thing, uh, you'll notice when you like. And I tr- I hope you all do go and look up the clip, but uh, you'll notice in the other nominees against Jack Palance that year uh, was Tommy Lee Jones. Oh my so- god. <laughs> Oh my God! Everything is connected. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so move on to next credits is uh, for it's a forecasting, I believe. Isn't yes, it? yes, Marion Doherty. Uh, yep, who uh, yeah, solid career worked on uh, Lethal Weapon, Gremlins Two, which is a, another very worthy sequel. Yeah, well, let's so, do both. Uh, both really good movies there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, not much. Yeah, she did a bang up job in the casting here. So yes, good work, Marion. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we move on then to uh, Bob Ringwood. Oh yes, uh, costume designer, 
who uh, did, you know, obviously was one of the guys who made the bat suit. One of the guys responsible for Michael Keaton being unable to move his neck. Yes, <laughs> a problem they didn't fix until like 2008 <laughs> with the Dark Knight's like, oh, no, I think they'll be fine. They <laughs> Let us not try to modify this in the next film or anything. Well, I'm mocking him, but he, he does great work. The suit is fantastic. Oh, I, 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 I maintain that this is like the best bat suit. But, oh, uh, hell yeah. We'll get into that. That's that's a, a a discussion for, you know, the actual main the main body of the show. I oh suppose. yeah, there's lots to get into with the grapple gun and everything. Mm. Oh yeah, but uh, he did. Uh, but uh, his other credits include uh, Dune, uh, Alien Three, and there's another Alien Three connection that we mention. We'll mention later on, and when it's appropriate. It's coming. <laughs> and uh, Demolition Man. Which is just a great movie. Hell so, uh, yes. That's mm, that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> like, uh, uh, and then underneath him, we have um, Miss Miss Basinger's costumes by Linda Hendrickson. Why do they have a separate one sometimes like this? Is it just because he he doesn't work with? I don't sound sexist, but like dresses and things like that. It could be. That could like that literally could be the 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 purpose I assume, of him, or is but, she just uh, a diva? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, but it could be that Kim Basinger was very like, no, I need, I need this person. I, I need. I them. have my people. But, uh, but she's uh, uh, Linda worked on uh, several very uh, worthwhile uh, projects as well. Uh, Benny and June, uh, the Adams Family, Scarface, uh, Beetlejuice, actually as well. What a, what a uh, career! And, um, yeah, and uh, Rhinestone, the uh, Dolly Parton. <laughs> Stallone musical. Thing. Everybody, please, if you're not going to watch that movie, at least look up a few videos on YouTube. Oh yeah, if, uh, go out of your way to find uh, Drinking Stone. Yes, it's like Stallone singing a country song, but it's like it's got like Budweiser, you made me a monster, <laughs> and they called him Drinking Stein. And like it's it, that's it. That's like and if you want to see Stallone in a cowboy, like a sparkly, spangly cow, cowboy outfit, doing that. There you go. Like that is my gift onto you. You know you want to see that. <laughs> uh, but uh, and then yeah, the Linda also did uh, apparently entirely the costumes because she's worked in the costume department on those films. But she did. Uh, she was the kind of head of costume in the uh, fantastically titled. Who is killing the greatest chefs of Europe? <laughs> what a question! And that's only the one of one of two films she did that job for. So, <laughs> and I've looked up the plot line to that, and it is it is exactly what it sounds like. So <laughs> that sounds a bit like the Pope must die. If you remember that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I haven't heard the Pope must die in years. I had that on VHS. <laughs> Actually, I think my sister had it, and then uh, so by default, it then fell to me. Years later, you know. Oh, is that the uh, Robbie Coltrane? Yes, yes, Robbie Coltrane. Yeah. Well, uh, so shout out to uh, the Pope Must Die minutes <laughs> and to the Robbie and, Coltrane uh, fandom out there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and the uh, who is killing the greatest chefs of Europe? Oh, minutes. many shout outs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, after that, then we move into one of the one of our favorites, uh, music by Danny Elfman, yes, Mr. Oingo Boingo himself. Yeah, and I like so much love for Danny Elfman in general here. But uh, between the two of us, uh, as John said, we're like indicated there. Uh, we're both really big fans of his uh, the band he was in uh, before uh, Oingo Bongo, which uh, the, you know great tunes. That most notably the theme tune to Weird Science, but um, another great movie. Yeah, yeah. And they did a, a plethora of other great, great songs. So if you if you're not familiar with Oingo Boingo, uh, I highly advise advise you to seek them out. But then Danny obviously did great work uh, with Tim Burton throughout the uh, throughout the nineties. Uh, some great scores. Um, I think uh, Edward Scissorhands obviously springs to mind. Beetlejuice in eighty seven. Uh, and then, like really underrated work, I find on uh, Mars Attacks. Oh yeah, yeah. A, 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 so the opening of Mars Attacks, that that music and all the ships approaching Earth is amazing. Well, it shows but, to me, uh, like the fact he can do something with Oingo Boingo, 
and then do those type of scores, that's real talent because they're two completely different fields. I don't understand how oh, you know being a good songwriter in one really translates to the other even. Yeah, I mean, like to listen to, like, yeah, the, 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 like take the the theme to Weird Science for example. To think the guy who made that, like who wrote that, then will go on to write the theme music to this. Exactly. Yeah. It's like it's a world of difference. It's like that's amazing. And then of course like, that's not all. Like he did more diverse kind of things. He did obviously the theme tune to The Simpsons, uh, and then uh, like things like Midnight Run, and, like a simple plan. Uh, and yeah, so and as I say too, like so, uh, you know, like, I think we mentioned last episode as well. He's uh, been sucked into the Fifty Shades franchise uh, as yeah. well. Mm, let's not mention it. And also, uh, I, I'm very reluctant to mention the fact as well that he, uh, of course, worked on Terminator Salvation. Yeah, but, but the thing is, that's just why, because the Terminator movie, like the, their music, was a. Uh, Brad Fidel or Fidel, the the original. Yeah, guy. yeah, and this sounds like a copy. Like there's no need for it to be who it is. You could get anybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, like, why not just get Brad back? Was he like, what? What was the point? What was the maybe thinking? he saw the script? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, but uh, and I think like yeah, because the music to Terminator Salvation isn't that great either. Mm. So again, a lot of elements, like as much love as we have for him, some of his more recent stuff hasn't been stellar. Much like but, Tim uh, Burton. Yeah, actually, yeah, the the intertwined in their decline, <laughs> perhaps. But uh, yeah, because I remember the last great bit of music from uh, Danny Elfman, I thought was the Planet of the Apes theme. Oh yeah, yeah, that was good. Is, I mean, not not necessarily the movie, which I don't I hate. But uh, yeah. the film's not great, but his soundtrack is amazing. Oh, yeah. Like it's really because it's got that weird that like, got. I don't know what what the what the instrument they're using is, but it has that you know, duk, 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 duk. <laughs> like it's a real. It's a, it's like something wooden, like he's hitting something wood. Anyway, weirdly, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> that was a good impression. <laughs> but uh, and then f the jump from one uh, sonic titan. To the next, oh. we have the, the the credits for Prince. Yes. Songs by Prince, the master. And uh, I know you like I like Prince. Okay, I know you are a major. Prince oh, fan, I love him, so. love him. In fact, I have I have this on vinyl. His his uh, soundtrack to this. Oh, it's great. <laughs> it's got a, in the notes. The yeah, the, in the, the inside, it explains how each track is sung from the perspective of the characters in the movie and who's singing what lines and things. So it's it's very interesting because if you just listen to the songs, you don't you don't pick up on that at all. <laughs> Let me tell you. But that's the thing, because I think it was originally, it was supposed to be like a duet album between him and Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like he was going to do the Joker parts, like the kind of funkier, livelier songs, and then the love element... I guess the Batman kind of element would be done by Michael Jackson, but that didn't come to fruition. I would, I would really. love to hear that. I think that'd be great. But uh, and there's a whole. I mean, the story of the 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 Prince soundtrack is a whole other. Like we could talk about that for hours. Oh so. God, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if uh, we just spend much more time on that. Or well, just, I will. Like, sorry, I will just pose one question to you though. I love the soundtrack. They're great songs, great Prince tunes, but do they fit Batman? Well, uh, it's kind of a tough one now to be like, because it's it's it, to me like I I think I saw this film before I knew who Prince oh. was. So like growing up, I was just like, oh, these are just the songs in the background of Batman. That's fair enough. And now, like, year, it's only years later, I was like, oh, Prince is this giant entity who was fitted in, who was, like, plopped into the Batman mold. So it, uh, the, the, but the, the, because those songs are so intertwined in the film's DNA mm. to me, they seem like, yeah, that's that all seems fine. But I can understand why to some people, like, it would be quite jarring to be like, oh, no, there's this kind of gothic brooding thing here. Oh, yeah. And then 
party man just like <laughs> and all that stuff like, like the... don't you dare insult party man <laughs> just like but like the throwing his royal badness over the <laughs> <laughs> over the top of but uh i mean like what else like you know like what else could they put in i mean like the joker tearing up to tearing up the museum to like you got the touch or something well, like i mean that. the second movie Okay, it's not all over the film, but they've got that song by Susie Sue. Or is it Susie and the Banshees or just Susie Sue, actually? I can't. You think of all people, I would know this. One of my favorite groups. <laughs> I, know this. I, th- I, think, I think it's just Susie. I think it is. But, uh... For some reason, that's, that's coming to mind. But that, that fits. Yeah, that's very it... Tim Burton. That's someone he would like. Yeah, that's, that's used very sparingly as well. Yeah. Like, it's just in the background during a party. So it's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense that that's playing. Well, but, although uh... apparently he, he has nothing against prince he like he does quite like prince apparently but yeah but he liked prince as an artist but he wasn't too thrilled about having <laughs> the songs in the film yeah but that's a story for another yes day, we will uh, we'll get into that when uh, prince reappears sort of <laughs> uh next credits uh we have ray lovejoy uh, the uh, Reverend from Springfield who uh, quit, quit that and went, went into film editing and uh, uh, not much to say about Ray um, they'd worked on 2001 oh, not uh, much to say Alien. he worked on two of the best movies <laughs> yeah oh, no, uh, Aliens and The Shining and you think that's good John he also worked on Krull oh, Kr- so. Krull the crowning jewel in that collection and wouldn't you know it John who also features in Kroll, but Liam Neeson, who would go on to be in Batman Begins. Oh my God. <laughs> it's I'm telling you, man, it all, it all ties We've in. We've uncovered it a conspiracy. Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> but uh, then uh, moving on, uh, next credit is uh, Anton First, the uh, tragically late Anton First, uh, did the production design uh, for this excellent, excellent work. Uh, but uh, uh, killed himself just a, I think it's just a year later. Yeah, yeah, very so, soon. Uh, yeah, but it's like it's kind of legacy now. Like, oh, designed probably like the best Batmobile there's ever been, and then killed himself. But uh, and also beyond that, left a pretty good, uh, you know, like like leg- legacy of work. Um, full Metal Jackets and uh, com- the Company of Wolves, like the Neil Jordan. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the fairy tale thing it was a fantastic, like really underrated film. Uh, beautiful to look at. And a lot of that's down to the production design of Anton First. So uh, if you haven't seen Company of Wolves, I highly recommend uh, giving it a look. Well, so. thank you, Mr. First. Yep. Uh, moving on then uh, to director of photography, Roger Pratt. Uh yeah, he's, he's another good career, like uh, worked on uh, Brazil. Which you can really see in some of the scenes. Oh yeah, yeah. There's some oh, very similar yeah. visuals. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, did some of the Harry Potter films as well, which I'm not too keen on. But I think you're a bigger yeah. fan than I. I wouldn't so. say I'm, I'm not like the biggest fan in the world, but I enjoy them. I think that I think they improve as they go on to a, an extent. I really like, uh, yeah, the fourth one, the Goblet of Fire, where it's the the tournament. Um, I know most people prefer the the third one, was it Prisoner of Azkaban? But uh, the fourth one for me, that's my fave. But uh, it goes, yeah, Harry Potter with the... Uh, oh, we were talking about Robbie Coltrane earlier. There you go. <laughs> and, of course, Gary Oldman. Yet again, connections everywhere you look. Yeah. And uh, one thing, like, I thought was curious about uh, Roger Pratt was um, apparently... I don't know if this would be in his wheelhouse. I suppose it is his responsibility. That uh, apparently when they released this on video, they had to go back and grade the film to be lighter. Because it was so dark in the cinema, the people complained that they couldn't see what was going on. <laughs> so, so I'm not too sure if that's like the lighting director or like if it, I think it would be the director of photography because he has to make sure it looks the best. You know, he's the guy making yeah. sure every image is perfect. I mean, I'd assume, I'd assume, so I guess uh, I'd assume though Burton has the final say. Yeah, but imagine they could. Well, you know, between the two of them, I guess that that. Uh, it falls down to Roger, maybe. Maybe I'm blaming, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm blaming this guy kicking him when he's down. Yeah, maybe he said to Tim, "No, no, no, this isn't working. This isn't working." But he, he was forced. <laughs> mm. 
But, uh, well, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> so just to be nice. Uh, and then uh, someone uh, coming up next to his... A little harder to be nice about uh, in more recent years. Uh, Bob Kane. Oh, yeah. Who is, uh, you know, synonymous with the with Batman in terms of like, you know, Batman was created by Bob Kane, uh, which you see, like, you know, his name's plastered over everything to do with Batman. Yeah, he's the person I think of anyway, being connected. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, like for years, I, I assumed that too, but it's kind of come out more recently that uh, it was actually he was riding on the coattails of Bill Finger, who was uh, you know one of the writers, and like not just Bill Finger, but other people as well who were you know doing a lot of the writing. So apparently, like Bob Kane, essentially he came up with uh, a character name and he drew a guy in like red spandex with like blonde hair <laughs> and a domino mask. And big like bat like wings, God. and then Bill Finger came in and was like, "Oh, what if he has like a cowl, and what if he has like a cape, and what if he's a bit darker, and what if like oh, he lives in a place called Gotham City, <laughs> and he and he starts going off on this tangent, so it sort of becomes apparent then that everything that we that we know and love about Batman ostensibly came from Bill Finger, but Bob Kane gets all the credit. So, so basically, Bill Finger just went. You know what? What if this character was was good? Basically, <laughs> what if we turned him into something actually half decent? It's one of those things. Like now, again, like I'm saying this, this is all like, yeah, you know, he said, she said, kind of thing. But uh, it seems to be nowadays it's commonly thought that like, yeah, Bill Finger was the driving force. And as we get into like other things too, like um, the creation of the Joker is another big point of contention. Because there's other, like Jerry Robinson, I think he called the guy. He's like, oh, I created the Joker. And then Bill Finger's like, no, I created it. And there's a whole big to-do. Oh, so, but but uh, we'll get into that uh, in a later episode. Well, I'd just so. like to say as well, before we, uh, we move on anywhere else, we haven't mentioned the actual visuals again. For, for oh, good God. reason, <laughs> though. For good reason. Because we are still, still just seeing... Uh, sort of a, a strange movement in the background of uh, the thing we've been looking at, this stone. It, it's moving, it's rotating slowly. We don't know what it is. We could be in a church, a graveyard, a tomb, mm. a cave. No idea. There seems to be, yeah, so sharp edges, but to what, yeah. you know? And we've it's... never seen the movie before, so we don't know. We're watching it a minute at a time. <laughs> I was like, the whole time, I was like, oh, why just get to Batman already? Would you come get on? Get to the point. I get... <laughs> but uh, perhaps, perhaps we'll find out what this thing is in the next minute. <sighs> Imagine so... that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's it for minutes two. Yeah, that's all so... I've got on minute two. So make sure to uh, join us again where we'll be doing minute three. And uh, partway through that minute, we finally get some actual action. Some <laughs> actual movie is happening. Get excited, people. It's thrilling. I like, like, depending on how much we edit this down, this could potentially have been like an hour's worth of podcasting without the film even really starting. At least so. we could talk about this for about four hours. We could go into everyone's histories. If you want that, the special editions will be coming in uh, many years. Where we'll, we'll just edit it all back in. It'll be fine. You won't even notice the difference and there'll be a comedic character joining us. Or there could be uh, by like minute 50 where we've ran out of things to talk about. <laughs> and we're just like, hey, let's just, hey, what, what, what else did Ray Lovejoy do? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, join us on Facebook. Uh, uh, you can just search for Bat Minute 89 and the Bat Minute 89 Listeners Society. Uh, we may come up with a new name, a bat-related pun. I'm not sure. Um, and then Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, all of them at BatMinute89. There's, we have a consistency in our theme. Um, and this episode, <laughs> I will change the shout-out. I'm going to give a shout-out to another one of my favorites, uh, Indiana Jones Minute. So make sure you check that out if you haven't uh, listened to that already. And we will see you again next time. Friday. Will our intrepid podcasters finally leave the labyrinth of lemon-colored labels? Will the streets of Gotham give them a royal welcome fit for a prince? Find out in the future. Same bat pod.
different bat minute.